Unlike our grandparents, we live in a world that we made. Until about 50 years ago, images of nature were the keys to feeling in art. Today, for most people, nature has been replaced by the culture of congestion, cities and mass media. We are crammed like battery hens with stimuli, and overload has changed our art. Capitalism plus electronics gave us a new habitat, our forest of media. The problem for art was how to survive there, how to adapt to it, because otherwise it was feared art would go under. The present has more distraction than the past. Works of art once had less competition from their surroundings. The background to the organized sound of Gregorian chant wasn't random noise. Silence was one of the dominant facts of medieval life. You listened to one thing at a time. In a pre-technological world, you also looked at one thing at a time. Things could not be reproduced, no print, no film, no cathode ray tubes. Each object, singular. Each act of seeing, transitive. Not today. Today, the object splits into a swarm of images of itself, clones, copies. The more famous an object is, the more cultural meaning it has, and the more unique people say it is, but the more it breeds. Mass production strips the image of its complexity so that it resembles a sign. A sign is a command. It's something you take in all at once. It means one thing only. It isn't any better for being handmade. Pictures are different. They're more complicated. They mean a lot of things. You scan them, and their meaning adds up and unfolds. You don't get it all at once. Pictures educate. Signs discipline. Mass language always tends to speak in the imperative voice. The idea of sitting down and painting this landscape like an impressionist was obviously absurd. But how could art defend itself against a torrent of signs which were more vivid than its own images? By assimilating, by grafting the vitality of media onto what had become a wilting language. That, at any rate, was the hope. In the 19th century, the world of the Industrial Revolution appeared in landscape painting, slowly pushing its way into a fixed aesthetic category like an intruder in paradise manufacture invading nature. The sign found its way into art a little bit later. The gap between the formal speech of painting and the lingo of signs began somewhere after 1900 when a few artists and poets realized that print was all around them and that it made up a visual language which art up to then had barely even scratched. The prophet of this was the Polish-French writer Guillaume Apollinaire, the poet of Cubism.
You read handbills, catalogues, posters that shout out loud, here's this morning's poetry. And for prose, you've got the newspapers. Sixpenny detective novels full of cop stories, biographies of big shots, a thousand different titles. Lettering on billboards and walls. Door plates and posters squawk like parrots. But the home of the quick message was America, especially New York. Its shapes were already a subject for American artists by 1920. To Joseph Stella, an Italian migrant artist, the Brooklyn Bridge was a cathedral of the new. It was the shrine containing all the efforts of the new civilization, America, the eloquent meeting point of all the forces arising in a superb assertion of their powers, an apotheosis. The vision of the new city as sublime, as a temple of progress, almost a new Jerusalem, was felt by other artists. Here by Georgia O'Keeffe. But in the late 20s and early 30s, none of them were interested in the street lingo, the flashing ads in lights, which astounded every out-of-towner in New York. That was too vulgar. It stood for the commercialism that American painters wanted to repudiate. The heroism of work, that was an acceptable subject. But the signs that sold the products of work, no. There was one exception. An American painter who loved what he called the New York visual dialect, Stuart Davis. Davis belonged to the same generation as Hemingway, and like him, he went to Paris and was deeply changed by contact with the French avant-garde. Cubism formed his style. Before he got to France in the early 1920s, Davis was doing Cubist-type paintings. But the brand names and words and signs dominated them as they had never been allowed to dominate a Braque or a Picasso. This painting was the precursor of all American pop art. The brand name itself was a kind of icon for Davis. It was fast, it delivered its meaning in quick bursts, and in painting it was a found object, a visitor from another medium. The word gave Davis's painting its rhythm, the choppy rhythm of American life as he felt it. The clue to that rhythm was jazz. Davis believed jazz was the first real American modernism. The brilliant colours on gasoline stations, chain store fronts and taxi cabs. Synthetic chemistry, fast travel by train, auto and aeroplane, which brought new and multiple perspectives. Electric signs five and ten cent kitchen utensils, movies and radio, Earl Hines hot piano and Negro jazz music in general. In one way or another, the quality of these things plays a role in determining the character of my paintings. Paris school, abstraction, escapism? Nope, just color space composition celebrating the resolution of stresses set up by some aspects of the American scene. But in their time, the 40s and 50s, Davis's images of mass culture were on their own. No major American painters were ready to go so far into the badlands of other media or to do it with that mixture of cool and brashness. Then, around 1955, some others did enter them, but from another direction. If you buy a half pound of bacon in a supermarket, you end up with an ounce and a half of plastic and cardboard wrapping around it. If your electric iron goes on the fritz, you simply chuck it away. (laughs) 
One of the peculiarities of a place like the city dump is that it makes you realize that New York throws away in the course of a week probably more manufactured goods than were produced in 18th century France in the course of a year. The motto was replacement, not maintenance, disposability and not durability. And there was a subject in this landscape of waste and this secret language of junk, because during the 50s, some American artists realized what the Dadaists in Europe had known about 30 years before, namely that societies reveal themselves in what they threw away. Street junk was to these men what the flea market had been to the surrealists. And among them, there was one budding master, a man in his 20s from Texas named Robert Rauschenberg. Actually, I had a kind of a, a house rule. If I walked completely around the block and I didn't find enough to work with, I could pick one other block in any direction to walk around, but that was it. The works had to, whatever I did, had to look at least as interesting as anything that was going on outside in the window. The result was his combines, large collages of refuse, things found and resurrected. He got to New York in the early 1950s, and since then, Rauschenberg has opened up more room for anti-formalist art than anyone else in America. Every artist after 1960 who believed that all of life ought to be open to art was in his debt, one way or another. We now take it for granted that art can be anything. It can be for any purpose, from pleasure to threat to systematic boredom. Some is meant for museums, some to be thrown away, and some to be performed, as in this piece danced by Rauschenberg in 1966, Pelican. This plurality at the end of the 70s is largely due to what Rauschenberg did in the 50s and 60s. Its roots are in Dada, and especially in the collages that Kurt Schwitters made in Germany in the 20s and 30s. Meltz pictures, he called them, modern city life describing itself in its own waste. Junk, torn posters, old photos, tickets. Rauschenberg applied this to the even brasher life of the American city. The New York streets gave him his palette of objects. In the studio, he sorted them out and glued them down. I tended to work in, in things that were either so abstract that uh, no one knew what this object was or it had been so mangled that you couldn't recognize it anymore or something so obvious that you didn't think about it. He punctuated them with slathers of paint. These painted links are what Rauschenberg got from abstract expressionism, and they remind us that the things in his combines are meant to hang together as paintings and not just sit there as objects. But the combines were meant to look a bit random. Each one was a rendezvous where the common objects of the day could gather. Monogram was the most notorious of all the combines. Why the goat? Partly, I guess, because he had one as a pet when he was a kid in Texas. He was bereaved by its death, and he wanted to resurrect it. Animals have one main use in Rauschenberg's art. They're innocent witnesses, survivors of nature in a flood of culture. Why the title? Because monograms lace through one another, as the goat does through the tire. But if you ask why it has lasted, why Monogram keeps its shock value despite 20 years of reproduction in the history books, the reason is probably sexual. The goat in the tyre is one of the wittiest images of sexual penetration ever made by an artist. Jasper Johns was always bracketed with Rauschenberg in the 1950s. Actually, the two of them were utterly unlike one another. Where Rauschenberg's work was garrulous, Johns was terse. Rauschenberg breathed out, but Johns breathed in. His work was about difficulty. 
It was extremely subtle and didactic, and like Marcel Duchamp, his mentor, Johns was interested in the ready-made image. He wanted to use things that were so simple, so familiar, that, as he put it, they left him free to work on other levels. New York painting had been full of inventions, of displays of character. Johns would show what could be done with things that were not invented, things that were so well known that they weren't well seen. Very early on, Johns gave a clear outline of his theme, which is the difference between science and art, which helps you understand the way in which art operates. He did this at first by painting targets. Now everybody knows what you do with a target. You pick up a gun and you shoot at it. But this means that you're looking at the target in a particular way because all your attention is fixed on the bull. You're not concentrating on the outer circles. In official language, one would call this an extreme example of hierarchical perception and selective looking. The target is a test, and Johns took it with a sort of deadpan irony to test what you expect a work of art to do. The painting denies the use of a real target. The fact that it is painted with all those dense touches of encaustic, so lovingly like the skin of one of Cezanne's apples, means that you're not meant to look at it the way that a marksman does. The centre is not more important than the rings. Every bit of the surface is equally important. You look at the whole of the picture. And so a sign, a target, has been turned into a painting fit for the museum stair which must be scanned. Two contradictory ways of looking. A paradox. On top of his painted target, he adds plaster casts, and there's another paradox with them. One wants to see them as images, perhaps elements of a portrait. But they're more like fossils, specimens, visual words that stand for classes of things, ear, hand, penis. The image turns into a sign, and thus, inside one painting, you have two ways of seeing, the sign becoming a painting and sculpture becoming a sign. No country has a more elaborate cult of its flag than America. It's the best known sign in the whole culture. The eye recognizes it in a flash and passes on. But the art of painting is to delay the eye. This is not a flag. Its motto comes from Magritte, this is not a pipe. Why? because it's a painting. This is a painting too. It has stars and stripes and it's made of cloth, but it is not a flag. Paint can make almost anything abstract, even a subject as highly charged as the American flag. We see the painting first, that pale, perfect skin, and the flag beneath it, the sign, has lost its power to command. It's real, but it's also completely abstract. Flags are only as flat as this in the ideal space of art. He did the same thing with numbers. He wasn't a great colorist, but as a tonal painter, Johns had no American rivals. So one ends up thinking of pictures like this, so beautifully made, not in the context of sums or computer displays, but as the end of a tradition of still life that begins with Chardin. These aren't beer cans. They're made out of bronze and then painted. So they're sculpture, pretending to be junk, pretending to be art. The brushes aren't real either. Neither is the coffee can. They're bronze too, and painted. John's work was seldom what it seemed to be. It was always about something else, about irony, manipulation, tradition, and the defense of painting in the face of a mass culture environment. You'd suppose the stage was set for pop in the 50s in America, and certainly the materials were there. But the culture from which pop sprang wasn't at all respectable as far as American artists in the 50s were concerned. Giant plastered donuts were what they had to defend their art against. After all, they had to live with this stuff, and there was nothing remotely exotic or pleasing about it. To them, it was the nightmare from which they couldn't wake, the erosive splurge of mass cult, of vulgarity. 
but the English didn't have to live with it. And so in the 50s, there were some English artists who saw the gross sign language of American cities with the kind of distant longing that Gauguin felt for Tahiti. They'd grown up with austerity and rationing and Dr. Strachey's national health teeth. But Hollywood, Hollywood had shaped their dreams. Forever young, forever sexy, and forever swollen with abundance. One of the inventors of pop back in the early 50s was an Englishman, Richard Hamilton. Everybody seemed to go to the same kind of sources. Everybody that was doing interesting work at that time and wanted to be figurative tended to go to second-hand material. They went to the, the mass media, something that had already been converted from real life into uh, processed pulp, processed television, processed uh, cinema or newspapers or whatever. And the visual, the visual world became a, a new landscape of second, secondary filtered material. In one of Hamilton's collages from 1956, the word pop appears in art for the first time, linked to a sort of Beverly Hills dream world. My own interests were certainly very specialized in that it seemed to me that the advertisers were uh, manipulating the public in a very skillful and interesting and amusing way that the difference between pop art and popular art is the fact that pop art is sophisticated, it's not done by the masses, but it's done by highly professionally trained experts for a mass audience. For the connoisseur who has everything. At last, a work of art to match the style of modern loving. The Critic Laughs, a perfect marriage of form and function, design and delight, created for you and yours by Europe's most caring craftsmen in an exclusive edition of only 60 examples. The Critic Laughs, thrill to the sensation of ownership. Hamilton is proud to present its new multiple. The Critic Laughs by Hamilton. It's the other, the other possibility, the other extreme of the, uh, of the hot dog, but it's, it's still, to some extent, a pop object. Uh, we, we had to tool up for the whole venture using uh, the same materials and the same, uh, same factories even to, uh, uh, that, that Brown used for the production of their case. Uh, made a, an instruction book and a guarantee card and tried to repeat the whole process of consumer product presentation. Of course, it's sold in, not in supermarkets or in chemist shops or in uh, department stores, but in um, rather smart galleries throughout the world, or presented in, in exhibitions in elegant museums. I've also made posters of this kind of subject and all the other ephemeral material, and the idea of making a commercial seems to me to be the realization of a dream when you can uh, go through the whole analogy of producing the object and making all the literature and then come to the great finale, which is that you make a film and present it on TV in the form of a commercial. And that uh, whole process is the work of art, to my mind. That is, that is the work rather than the single object. That the analogy is what's in to, to, to post to the industrial and advertising process uh, is much more important than the object as a sculptural form. More than 40 years ago, a great Marxist critic, Walter Benjamin, said that it was going to be hard and maybe impossible for any child raised in the howling blizzard of signals to find his way back into the exacting silence of a book. Benjamin died in 1940, but what he feared from radio and cinema and advertising came a thousand times truer with mass television. 
The box you're watching has done more to alter the direct discursive relationship of images to the real world on which painting used to depend than any other invention this century. This isn't really a matter of good or bad programming. Everybody knows the box is a cornucopia of dung most of the time, but the effects, I mean, don't depend on the quality of programs. They flow from the nature of television itself. You only have two choices when you're watching a movie in a cinema. You can go or you can stay. With television, there's a third. You change the channel. But there must be... Uh, as I well as... Was... was... <laughs> Candidate's wife of oh, California, and we're going to have a lot of... How do you like those uh, bolts, be my guest? Really lengthen out yesterday. Judy Woodruff. <laughs> anyway, it really has... There have been two examples. Disclosure to the ceiling. There was a store with a headline... And you also do some uh, looking for gold. Right? That is, to proceed aggressively with... <laughs> Every boy's trigger list of creamy ice cream. And it's... And so, in a chaotic way, the dream of the Russian constructivist filmmakers and of the German Dadaists has come true with television because whole societies have learned to see in terms of montage and juxtaposition. Ours is the cult of the electronic fragment. Because it's so intimate and casual, the box worked on us in other ways too. Its images had a weird, contradictory kind of tone. They were real, present in the room. But at the same time, they were very artificial because their illusion wouldn't hold. They kept creeping up the screen or breaking off into dots and lines and jabber, not like film in a cinema. Their reality was provisional. Their reality was provisional, but the colour was ultra-vivid. Electron colour, not the colour of ink or nature or paint. Television messages get to you in small packets. You don't scan the screen as you scan a painting, and you don't inspect it the way you might inspect a Chinese vase. The fate of these messages, these images, is to get equalised. Catastrophe, love, war, soap, they all pour forth in an overwhelming glut. And like radiation, which in fact they are, they are everywhere, and they have affected art. And one of the artists they most affected in the 60s was Rauschenberg. He lives a long way from New York now, on an island off the Florida coast. No junk here, but his work is still saturated with images from the media. One's bombasted by magazines, uh, TV sets. I didn't have a TV then, but uh, TV sets. The refusal the excess of the rest of the world, even though you don't know them. I can't move again until, if I forget where anything is. If I could paint or make an honest work, it somehow should incorporate all of these elements, which were and are a reality. Collage is a way of getting an additional piece of information that's impersonal. And I've always tried to work impersonal. In the early 60s, printed images began to replace objects in Rauschenberg's work. The bank of images included anything from 15th century reproductions to diagrams from the Scientific American to yesterday's front page. As the images in his work in the 60s piled up, the paintings took on a heightened documentary flavour. He wanted to give canvas the accumulative flicker of a colour television set. The subject was glut. I don't think there's any doubt at all. I, I think of the league, I think the only one in the end. Since I came in office. Pepsi. In the morning, the assembled repeat. It's not valuable unless you suffer. I don't know where. His view of the media was both affectionate and ironic. He liked excavating whole histories within an image. 
histories of the media themselves. Consider this red patch. It's a silkscreen enlargement of a photo that he found in Life magazine, which was in turn a parody of this famous painting, Duchamp's nude descending a staircase. The painting was based on an early sequential photo by Marais. So the image bridges 70 years of technological time right there. It goes from photography to painting to photography back to painting. But the irony is that it ends up looking like the figures of Adam and Eve expelled from Eden in Masaccio's fresco in Florence, which turns the image of Kennedy, who was dead by then, into a sort of vengeful god with a pointing finger, thus fulfilling the prophecy of the 19th century French diarist Edmond de Goncourt. The day will come when all the modern nations will adore a sort of American god, about whom much will have been written in the popular press and images of this god will be set up in the churches, not as the imagination of each individual painter may fancy him, but established, fixed once and for all, by photography. On that day, civilization will have reached its peak, and there will be steam-propelled gondolas in Venice. From television, film and photography, we receive a stream of images every day. There is no way of paying equal attention to all that surplus, so we skim. The image we remember is the one that most resembles a sign. Simple, clear, repetitious. We absorb rather than inspect. Indifference becomes our second skin. Everything the camera gives us is slightly interesting. Not for long, just for now. The human extension of the glut of images is celebrity, which replaces the Renaissance idea of fame. The artist who understood this best and became best known for understanding it was Andy Warhol. Warhol is nearly as famous as Picasso, at least on the level of chit-chat and gossip. But Picasso was famous for his energy and masculinity Warhol for his passivity and sexlessness. He became a famous artist by silently proclaiming that art can't change life, whereas others once did by loudly giving the impression that it could. Um, no, I don't think I'm a revolutionary artist. He got started in the 50s as Andy Warhola, a Polish kid from Pittsburgh who made it to New York as a commercial artist. By the end of the 70s, he'd relapsed into being another kind of commercial artist, doing Nescafe Society portraits, a painter without a subject. His career as a man with something to say lies in between. Art is short for artist. I thought um, words are just always uh, made shorter, so art was just cut from the word artist and made uh, shorter. What he extracted from mass culture was repetition. I want to be a machine, he announced. Warhol loved the sameness, an infinite series of perfectly standardized products. When Monet painted in series, he did it to glorify the eye, to show how it could discern tiny differences. Discrimination within abundance was the essence of such painting. Today, we have sameness within glut, and that was what Warhol painted. His work in the early 60s was a baleful mimicry of advertising without the gloss. It was about the way that advertising promises that the same pap with different labels will give you special, unrepeatable experiences. Advertising flatters people that they're a bit like artists. The consumer is rare, discriminating, a connoisseur of experience. If Warhol was once subversive, and in the early 60s he was, it's because he turned that round. A famous artist who loved nothing but banality and sameness. I want to be a machine, to print, to repeat, which was the most cunning sort of dandyism. He began by doing straight advertisements, then he ran ironic commentary on them, but by the 70s, advertisers were copying him, like this. Warhol's autistic stare was the same for heroes and heroines, 
All you learn is that celebrity breeds clones, thousands of signs for itself, a series without a limit. The image is less painted than registered. No nuances, just slips in the silk screen. It looks coarse, grainy, quick. It wants you to glance at it like a television screen rather than scan it like a painting. And like American TV in the 60s, it's also haunted by death. And as with TV, the violence Warhol enjoyed got filtered through a cool, indifferent medium, photography and silkscreen. These disaster paintings have one subject in common. Not just death, rather the state of being an uninvolved spectator. The eye passes them like that man passing in the background. What this added up to was one piercing insight about the nature of media. But that was it. It could be done over and over again, but not developed further as art. The idea had a half-life, like a radioactive isotope. It sent out a lot of radiation in the 60s, and then it became feeble, and then dead. Boredom finally became boring. But the nature of mass imagery fascinated other artists in the 60s as well. If Warhol and Rauschenberg were into television, Roy Lichtenstein was about print. His best known source was American comic strips of the 40s and 50s, the stuff that artists of his generation who made the pop movement grew up on. To its detractors, it looked about as challenging as bubblegum. Take a comic and blow it up. But there was more to it than that. She's the girl who stole my heart, my Venus in blue jeans is the Cinderella I adore. She's my very special angel to a fairy tale come true. They say the seven wonders end the world. But I don't think that's it's, it's dealing with the images that have come about in, in the commercial world and it's using that because there are certain things about it which are impressive or uh, bold or something. And it's that uh, quality of the images that I'm interested in, the kind of texture that the dots make and, and various things that are usable uh, to me in my art for expressing um, uh, that feeling, it's, it's, but it's not saying that the commercial art is terrible or uh, look what we've come to. That, that may be a sociological fact, but that's not what this art is about. Printer's dots were the basis of Lichtenstein's style, a code that ended up looking very cool and abstract. It was a way of distancing the image, making it both big and remote. And like John's, Lichtenstein was intrigued by the difference between scanning and looking. You scan a frame in a comic strip and then flick on because comics exist to tell a story. But a painting is meant to detain you. Make a museum scale comic and you have another paradox about the way that we see art. Probably Lichtenstein's work has been around too long for its shock value to last, but in the 60s, when it was new, its ironies really worked. Another source for art in mass culture was the American billboard. James Rosenquist used to paint them for a living. In my billboard painting experience, I painted uh, Oh, hundreds of square feet of Franco-American spaghetti, and I painted a uh, large beer glass, 60 feet long, and, uh, and some bacon, uh, those huge pieces of bacon, and the salesman would come along and they'd say, that beer hasn't got enough hops in it, you have to make it a little bit lighter, or the bacon is dirty, or that 
It's Franco-American spaghetti orange is dirty, so I'd go home at night with it saying, oh, no. There's a kind of Buckeye surrealism in big American advertisements with their weird meetings of image and their overlaps and sudden cutoffs and giant size. And that went into Rosenquist's paintings. They had a casual narrative style, but enormous, the scale of 19th century history painting. Like billboards, they were about paradise, but a paradise of consumers, fatally compromised. Rosenquist summed up his ambition to be a painter of American history in the one major painting that the Vietnam War provoked, the F-111. The title comes from a bomber the Americans were using against the Vietnamese. Rosenquist distilled a sour irony from the contrast between that killing machine and those emblems of the good life, the life that so many Americans believed was being defended outside Saigon in 1965. Pop was big and brash. It had learnt that from other media. But there was no chance it could survive outside the museum. On the street, real mass culture would have simply crushed it. This gap between art and life was not closed. Now and again, an artist would try putting a big picture among the billboards. This one is by Alex Katz. A set of pretty upper bourgeois American profiles with one black face thrown in can do nothing against 42nd Street. In a culture of mass communications, art has to survive either by stealth or by living in those game parks we call museums. And no country in the world makes that clearer than America, the home of the most enlightened patronage and of the most profound indifference to the visual environment that our century has known. The city that put up the stiffest resistance to the idea of culture with a capital C was this one, Las Vegas. You can't imagine an art museum in a place like this, and in fact here the idea of art simply evaporates because there's nothing to do. It flies off in the face of the illusions of which this place is composed. Sudden wealth, endless orgasm, Dean Martin. This is the Disney world of terminal greed, and no wonder it had such an enormous appeal to the pop sensibility. Because here you have an infinite variety of signs which are all plugging exactly the same product, luck. Now the product's abstract and only the signs are real. And so Vegas sums up American giganticism, not because it's big, but because it pretends to be. Its monuments, the city lights, are conceived on a scale much beyond anything that most artists ever get to work on. And so really the town is a work of art, lousy art, but art all the same. And no wonder that this festive junk food for the eyes had such an appeal to artists and critics. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again Because a vision softly creeping Left its seats while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still remains Within the sound of silence in restless dreams I walked alone Narrow streets of cobblestone Beat the halo of a street lamp I turned my collar to the cold and damp When my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light That split the night And touched the sound a silence And in the naked light I saw Ten thousand people Maybe more Maybe more People talking without speaking People hearing without listening People writing There is no way that museum art can rival the commercial extravaganzas of the real world the artists who worked with neon and lights in the 1960s certainly couldn't. 
Their efforts were as pointless as building a souvenir that rivaled the Eiffel Tower. Who's a die you do not know? Silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words that I might teach you. Take my arms that I might reach you. Put my words like silent raindrops fell. And echoed in the wells of silence. And the people bowed and prayed. In fact, there was only one artist who took on the full weight of the American commonplace, its giganticism, its power of spectacle. But he did it by irony, and his work went far beyond any limits one could assign to the pop sensibility. He was Klaus Oldenburg, the thinking person's Walt Disney. <laughs> I always try to attend the Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is uh, held in New York. And sometimes if I'm in Europe, I made a special point of coming back so I could attend it. I guess it all started when I was uh, small. Uh, I was always taken to the parade, and uh, it's always uh, figured in my imagination, uh, the excitement of seeing those huge balloons in the air moving about. But my interest in the parade is not so much an interest in the circus aspect of it, uh, or in the clowns and, and the floats. I'm, I'm really specifically interested in these balloons uh, on that scale and what they do in the air. And uh, the whole engineering aspect of getting these balloons down uh, through all the streets and the whole process of filling the balloons with gas, which goes on a whole uh, 12 hours before the parade. All these parts of the parade are very interesting to me. And uh, it's the balloons that I come to see rather than anything else. Born in Sweden, raised in Chicago, Oldenburg grew up fascinated by the size of things American. From the beginning, his art was literally about appetite, the desire to touch, squash, stroke, absorb, digest, and become what he saw. Probably I, I, uh, I do two things that are contrary. I, I try to, to make the art look like it's part of the world around it. At the same time, I take great pains to show that it doesn't function as part of the world around it. He took ordinary things. Small ones got huge, soft ones hard. Hard ones went soft. This is a ladder. This is a saw. The logic of use is gone. Things take on multiple meanings and they keep alluding back to the human body. A Chicago fire plug becomes a torso with breasts and nipples, a monumental new. This is the original fire plug because this fire plug was directly outside of my house and this was the fire plug I saw every day and uh, is more or less the one that uh, uh, my fireplug fantasies are based on. This is the one that was gone in 1968 as a souvenir of the Democratic Convention. This way it's kind of uh, breasts and if you turn it upside down it becomes a uh, bottom half of the torso, these being legs. I like to take an object and uh, deprive it of its function completely. Take an ordinary object, change its scale, its material, and suddenly it is a stranger to the world, weird and complicated. Well, I mean, I have a, a, a condition I want to express about form, and um, then uh, an object sort of fits into that condition, and then I take the object without thinking too much about the object. That is, this could just as well have been a, a bank vault, except that I, I like the, uh, the lights, which are very simple, you know, very straightforward and symmetrical form which is what I was looking for, something uh, uh, geometric and uncomplicated. I suppose the best examples of this recomplication of an ordinary thing back into an image lie in Oldenburg's sculptural projects, his big ones, the monuments. Not very many of them have actually been built, but in Philadelphia, this one was. 
And what could be more ordinary than a clothespin? But on the other hand, you'd have to go some way before you found anything more dreamlike and grotesque than a clothespin 40 feet high. Like a monster in a movie, it suggests that the real world has somehow contrived to rise against its owners. But it's also partly human, a fact which underscores its monstrosity. The clothespin has two legs, and one is encouraged, therefore, to read it as a man. The spring clip on the thing's torso suggests compression, force, inhibition. The angles are all sharp and there's nothing flabby. And the thing is in fact a giant authority figure, a sort of parody of the hero in sculpture, a modern colossus of Rhodes. Oldenburg's range goes all the way from that to the pastoral, like this giant trowel. In his power of invention and his drive to impose his whole self on the world, fears and all, he is the nearest equivalent to Picasso that America has yet produced. But for every artist of Oldenburg's seriousness, there were a hundred bandwagons. By the end of the 60s, the pop sensibility was like a mechanized carnival. The avant-garde takes over the electronic village and the prophet of this idea, a Canadian professor named Marshall McLuhan, was one of the last thinkers in the world to believe that artists were still ahead of the game. The artist is the enemy, but in our time, the artist has become the very basis of any scientific uh, power of uh, perception or making contact with reality. It now seems that McLuhan was wrong. The game had finally got ahead of the artist. One of the catchwords of the late 60s in art as in gossip was information. And since the medium was the message, the quality of information was not held to matter very much. The sheer amount of it was so glamorous. When you surround people with electric information, the overload of information becomes fantastic. The amount of information in the environment under electric conditions is many times greater than that of uh, the normal human environment pre-electric. And there's only one natural response to such overload, and that is pattern recognition. American educators are so serious that they exude parody all the time. And this place is a parody of the McLuhanist state of mind. It's called the Living History Center, and it's in Philadelphia. We like this country very much, really. Here, the kiddies can have what is called a non-elitist, multi-dimensional environmental learning experience. Translation, compulsory fun. They can listen to bits of the Declaration of Independence on the phone. They can look at period photos and bus tickets on the big index wheels. And they learn nothing. The medium is the message here, and it turns the brain to cornflakes. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they it's are giant endowed pedal by their curving, curving down the rights. Creamy white outside, rose-colored inside. It still retained that shape from the last gaze that it from the first year. The world will note that the first time it was was not only a military base. To plant the first we won the race for recovery against the Germans. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of... The good side of the pop sensibility was its openness to life, its readiness to let art react to mass culture. The bad side was the manipulation and promotional garbage that flooded the art world in the 60s. Instant this, instant that. Probably you couldn't have one without the other. We were told over and over again that art based on mass media was more democratic than art that wasn't. It could survive in the big wide world, but generally that turned out not to be true. Whether it was difficult exacting stuff like Jasper John's or just entertainment like most pop art, it needed the museum more than ever. You want it that way or the other way? Well, it's a square plinth, so we can turn it around if we don't like it. 
<laughs> For all the talk, art based on the media turned out to be just as fragile as any other kind. The trouble is that in a showdown, any showdown between painting and the big media, painting cannot possibly win. People believe what they see on the screen, in photos, or even on the box, but nobody extracts the essential information for the conduct of their lives from looking at paintings anymore. The thing is that, compared to the media, art's a small thing. It's just a, a vibration in a museum, really. And it deals with what hasn't already been said. It isn't even a very good religion. But once it gives up its claims to seriousness, it's shot. The pop sensibility and its ironies nearly took these claims away, dissolved them in the doctrine that the medium is the message. But then it became apparent that all this doctrine boiled down to was the idea that it doesn't matter what art says. Now perhaps Andy Warhol was right for his moment when he said that pop art was about liking things. But even so, it's not enough. Man is an animal who judges. And even in a culture which has split as disastrously in as many ways as ours has, the problems of choice and taste and moral responsibility for images still remain. In fact, they get harder. But the rock upon which the avant-garde sank was that art could no longer control that responsibility. <laughs>